<clears throat> so this, I got this email right after class on Wednesday. Um, I'm not sure if I want to call myself accidental um, brilliance here. This is um, from NPR. It's actually the national NPR um, talking about cool things that happened in science kind of by mistake. And if you scroll all the way down past the cute frogs and the funky blue stuff from Oregon State, and then the pikas from in the gorge, eventually you get down to the bottom where number 11 is these strange looking viruses, which are actually from my lab here at PSU. Um, this is a picture taken in the basement of Science Building 1. Um, viruses in glass houses, and this name may look vaguely familiar to some of you. Uh, who is that guy? Yeah, I have no idea. I wouldn't claim to know him at all. Uh, there will be, so this is, these are nominees for the Golden Mole Award. Um, the winner will be announced on Morning Edition next Tuesday. So um, listen to Morning Edition um, Tuesday morning next week. Um, unfortunately, I don't think they give you a chance to vote. So um, maybe should I try and hook the clickers in or something? You know, we'll see. <laughs> Speaking of which, <laughs> everyone's favorite part of lecture. Oh, come on. If I could get my, here we go. <clears throat> a, is, a is the answer for everything here, <laughs> by definition. Okay, so <clears throat> if you wanted to find out how many places in a living cell TF2D bound to, what experiment would you do? A band shift experiment or EMSA, DNA footprinting, cell X, chromatin amino precipitation, or affinity chromatography? Ten. <coughs> Do we want some more time? Yes. yes. Okay. Should we just start this all over again? Yes. yes. Okay. We'll do that. Start it all over again. Thirty seconds. 
want yet another round, or is this okay? Well, no, it's never okay, I know, but. <clears throat> so um, pretty divided in terms of opinions on this. Um, so there are a couple of things that I thought I would actually add the pen to about this. And let's move these down. So I um, want to find out in a living cell. How many of these techniques work on actual cells? The only one is this one right here. <laughs> so um, the band shift experiment and DNA footprinting experiments all depend on having a piece of DNA that you know what it is specifically looking at. And so that's not going to tell you, you know, how many of these different places it binds to. Cellex is a completely in vitro technique in glass, which of course we always say in plastic because no one uses glass anymore. But the idea there is that you're looking at a population of random DNA sequences. So you're just looking at all those random sequences. Affinity chromatography also you have to have a very specific sequence. So if you want to find out where all the places are in the genome that TF2D is binding to, chromatin immune precipitation is the way to do that. Um, lots of antibodies to different proteins that are part of TF2D. We'll talk about some of those today. And you just use that to do the precipitation with. And in fact, that's exactly how the number for the 70,000 promoters that we talked about last time actually came from exactly this kind of experiment, looking at where TF2D is binding in the cell. So um, the answer is D. So our next question, <clears throat> you have an inactivating mutant in the operator sequence of the tyrosine operon that is regulated similarly to the tryptophan operon. You expect no expression of the tryptophan operon under any conditions, low expression of the tyrosine operon with or without tyrosine, high expression of the tyrosine operon with tyrosine and low without tyrosine, vice versa, low with and high without, or high expression under any conditions. It is inactivating the operator. I'm guessing we'd like some more time on this one, too. Let's, um, let's start again. OK, again, you need to vote second time. Vote early, vote often. Yeah. The operon, the operon that is regulated similarly. 
five. Is it that much fun? <laughs> Again, all over the place. Um, so when I see something like this, I think that it means I didn't do a good enough job of explaining it in the first place. So I'll take it mea maxima culpa on this. Um, so uh, what is an operator? It's a sequence. OK, yes, means it's DNA. So what, what binds to it? So a repressor binds to it. So if you have an inactivating mutant in the operator, what does that mean about repressor binding? It won't bind. It's not going to bind to the operator. If you don't have repressor binding to the operator, what does that mean about polymerase? It's going to be always on. So not that you're not going to get any, they're going to get no expression. So A is is clearly out, um, and it makes no difference if there's tyrosine around or not because that's what's binding to the repressor. So we're left with B or E as our as our two options, and you know, low versus high. And in this case, when we talked about the tryptophan operon, there's no positive regulators, not like what you see with LAC. And so it's just the negative regulation. So it is, yes, E, high, yay, or not, as the case may be. Depends on which one you voted for. So does that, um, does that make sense? Do people get this or not, as the case may be? Otherwise, I can talk about, I don't have the slides with me for those operons, but we can talk more about operons next time if people want to. Yes, more operons next time? OK. I will, I will do that. OK, so now we actually finally have the image of my favorite protein or my least favorite protein. Depends on what day of the week it was when I was during graduate school. Um, the NTRC protein, which is present here as a multimer, which is why I added these two dots here. Um, it interacts with the RNA polymerase at a promoter in a closed complex through this DNA looping, which is just like what happens with the vast majority of eukaryotic transcriptional regulators, loops, interacts with the polymerase. There's ATP hydrolysis. That gives you an open complex formation. And you can even visualize this in the electron microscope. This is the complex of NTRC. This is the complex of the RNA polymerase. And they loop and interact with each other. So that's the bacterial example of enhancers. They can be long ways away. They come in different pieces of DNA, et cetera. Uh, that's it for bacteria for today. Now we're going to start talking more about what's going on with eukaryotic translation, transcriptional regulation. Uh, and this has to do with the activator proteins, or also known as enhancer binding proteins. Those get used completely interchangeably relative to each other. Um, they are modular, which is actually a lot like what we've talked about already. They've got different domains. Those different domains are different things. And the classic example here is the so-called GAL4 protein. Regulates genes important for galactose metabolism in yeast. Um, has two domains. Has a DNA binding domain and an activation domain. And there were some really classic experiments done by Mark Tashney um, and his group um, where they basically mixed and matched different pieces of this protein. And they could find that activation was dependent on having one of these activation domains, but only when it was bound to DNA. And they could reprogram where this would bind to DNA by putting in a different DNA binding domain than otherwise it would have. And so a different DNA binding domain, of course, can interact with a different sequence. And so you can, using genetic engineering techniques, basically take, make this chimeric protein. Half of it's from yeast, half of it's from bacteria. If you put this into a cell where you have the normal DNA binding sequence for this transcriptional activator, it does nothing. And the way you know that it does nothing is you have a, again, artificial construct which has the LAC-Z gene 
LAC Z is beta galactosidase. We talked about normal regulation that happens in bacteria with this. This is now just being used as a so called reporter gene. Reporter gene is something you put into a different cell, different <coughs> organism that that cell doesn't have. And so yeast cells don't have beta galactosidase. If you put in this bacterial gene and put in the right substrate, and we'll see this a little bit later on, usually something that goes from colorless to blue then you can detect expression of that gene. So here, in the case of your reporter gene with the DNA binding sequence for GAL4 and a hybrid protein, nothing happens. If you put in the DNA binding sequence for the bacterial binding part of the protein that you put in here, it interacts with everything else here at the Tata box, which is not shown here, and then the gene is turned on. So one of the big questions that came up, we know actually a lot about DNA binding domains, and we talked about that last time. Alpha helices are a couple of beta strands sticking in the major group of DNA. Um, we know a lot about that. On the other hand, activation domains are nowhere near as well defined. Um, there are a whole bunch of prolines or glutamines or acidic residues um, or just something that's sticky. Uh, so these are not well defined at all, and they seem to be... You know, a lot of context dependence, and probably that has to do with how they're actually working. Because what's happening with these activators or enhancer binding proteins is this activation domain is going to bind to something. Binds to the mediator, binds to some of the general transcription factors, and in that interaction helps to get the RNA polymerase to the promoter in order to get transcription to take place. Wanted to introduce this concept of the so-called holoenzyme. Holoenzyme is just the RNA polymerase plus all of the extra stuff. Um, and at some promoters, you've got really nice organized assembly like we talked about last time. First you have TF2D binding, then you have TF2B, then you have TF2E, then you have TF2F, then you have the polymerase, then you have TF2H. That happens at some promoters, but at most promoters it seems to be all of this stuff is together and then gets brought to the promoter, or probably more likely is the promoter gets brought to that polymerase complex. And that really has to do with the presence of these activator and activation domains, which are sticky and help to you know, pull these things all to the promoter. So this is, again, a very general process, these guys interact all over the place. They interact with TF2D, they interact with TF2B, they interact with the mediator. Basically, any part of the pre-initiation complex you can think of, there's some activator that interacts with it. As if that wasn't confusing enough, there's also a whole bunch of proteins which are also transcriptional regulators, but don't bind to DNA. Okay, wait a minute, how can this be happening? What you're supposed to be doing is binding to parts of the pre-initiation complex and bringing those to the promoter. If your protein is not binding to DNA, like we saw in the case with GAL4, like say the, the strange chimeric protein with no binding site, it shouldn't be working, right? So how can you have a non-DNA binding protein stimulating transcription? Well, the answer is because of cooperativity and interactions with other proteins which do bind to DNA. And so here is an example, some of the co-activators here, this sort of orangish banana, and then this dog bone, the pink dog bone here, um, are proteins that are not binding to DNA, will only bind to DNA in the presence of other DNA binding proteins. So again, highly cooperative in terms of binding. These guys don't bind at all. However, as soon as these proteins will bind, then you have coactivator interactions. And this coactivator will now help to activate transcription. So it's this complex, and this complex process, and again, complex in terms of multiple different proteins, but also complex in terms of all of the different proteins and combinations thereof that come together. Yeah? Uh, 
Right. So it's a, it, you can yeah. So they're not they don't bind directly. They're binding indirectly to DNA. Yes. Like so so the right. The so so the only co-activators here are the dog bone and the banana. Uh, <laughs> high resolution high resolution structures here for our proteins. Um, these all the other ones are the these guys the little ones are all specific DNA binding proteins. The shoe is a co-repressor. Uh, and just like you have a co-activator, the co-repressor doesn't bind to DNA by itself, but through interactions with DNA binding proteins, it comes to DNA. And then, since it's well, a repressor, is going to repress transcription. Uh, in some cases, there's an RNA which is also involved in this process. So you have non-coding RNAs. And in this case, it seems to provide kind of some glue between the DNA binding proteins and the coactivator. So you've got multiple different ones here. The other thing to point out here is that coactivators can interact with lots of different DNA binding proteins. So here, we've got our little blue and the gray. Here, we've got purple and green. Um, all of them can interact with each other, and it's going to be different combinations of proteins which are going to lead to either activation or repression. There was another question here, I thought. Hand? Yeah. So, are we talking about the fact that we might think of the combination of binding the RNA? So, the question is basically sorry to paraphrase what do coactivators do? We'll get there in just a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So coactivators do not at any point bind to proteins. They simply bind to other proteins that are the binding DNA. Um, okay. Right, that's what I think I think <laughs> I think you may have misspoken right at the beginning. Which is fine. Yeah. They do they do not bind to DNA. Coactivators and co-repressors do not bind to DNA. Okay. They will not bind directly to DNA. They will associate through protein protein interactions with DNA binding proteins. Okay. Other questions about this? This is kind of a funky concept. Um, so this is getting back to your question about how, how these things are working. Uh, and basically, it's not unlike all of the enhancer binding proteins. They interact all over the place. So you can have co-regulators here. And this is either a co-activator or a co-repressor that will interact with proteins that are bound at enhancers way upstream, way downstream. So those that bind right next to where the promoter is. These co-regulators can interact directly with RNA polymerase II and the general transcription factors. This is supposed to be TBP, by the way, this little horseshoe down here. Or they could also be interacting with nucleosomes. And we'll talk a lot more about nucleosomes um, as we move along here. Probably some of the best understood of the co-regulators interact with nucleosomes as opposed to interacting with the pre-initiation complex itself. One of the ways that you can get enhancers a little bit closer to the polymerase is through DNA bending proteins. So last time we asked about now how do you know how you get an enhancer to work really at the particular promoter that it's supposed to be working with. One way to do that is to have halfway between where the enhancer binds and where the promoter is, something that bends the DNA, and then brings the two of them much closer to each other. Uh, turns out that's also the case for the NTRC system that I worked on. Uh, but a DNA bending protein can really get the enhancer much closer to the promoter, but also can get other DNA binding proteins to be associated with each other. And so this is one way that you can get that to happen. Another way is sort of the flip side of that. Instead of bringing stuff closer together, it's preventing an enhancer binding protein in one piece of DNA from activating a promoter it shouldn't be interacting with. And so this is the whole concept of insulator elements. And so what happens with an insulator element, as an element, element always means what? 
the DNA sequence and what kinds of things interact with elements usually? Proteins, which also will very often will be called factors, right? So factors interact with elements. So um, these factors here, or here we have our insulator binding protein, will bind to these insulator elements and do exactly what you would think an insulator does. Basically, it insulates anything between these insulator elements from everything else. And what that means is if you have an enhancer that's insulated from other genes, it will only interact with genes that are on that same basic piece of DNA. And if you think back to way back before like the first midterm, um, late dark ages, there were all of these loops of chromatin. And it seems that a lot of these loops are basically these domains where you've got between insulator sequences where you can have enhancers and promoters interacting with each other. But they don't interact outside of that. Exactly how that works is a really interesting question that we don't have a good answer to right now. Uh, but <clears throat> Be that as it may. We also talked a little bit about our barrier sequences. Remember, barrier sequences have to do with the spread of heterochromatin. They're usually proteins that are bound to the DNA, sometimes specific sequence. They're just going to block the spread of your histone read writer complexes. Um, and they may even be some kind of enzymatic activity that's going to change what's going on there. So if you look at overall chromosome structure, We've got barrier sequences, which are also going to bind to these specific proteins, and these insulator elements um, binding to insulator binding proteins. And you can look at chromosomes and see here, everything which is in yellow are these insulator elements, and not so much the insulator elements, because it's hard to detect the insulator elements, use an antibody to an insulator binding protein. And you see that it binds at various different places um, across your chromosome. So lots of different places lots of different domains which are now being isolated relative to each other. So that's the basic answer to your question that you had last time about how do enhancers then know what genes to interact with. They're insulated from everything else. So we talked a little bit about histone modification. I wanted to mention one example of this. Uh, remember that we have lots of changes that happen on the tails of various different histones. This is histone H3, lysine 4, methylation, 3, 2, or 1. And here, histone H3 at lysine 36 that gets methylated. And it turns out that when you have transcription with RNA polymerase 2 through templates that have, and I say templates, again, since you're double-stranded DNA, that have nucleosomes on them, this RNA polymerase carries with it proteins that will modify all of the nucleosomes behind it. And it seems to be this is a way to mark kind of like what we saw looking at um, the initiation of replication, marking that, hey, this promoter's been used. And we don't necessarily want to be using it again and again. I give you one guess what these proteins associate with, this little pink tongue sticking out here. It's what everything else interacts with. It's the infamous CTD, C-terminal domain of the polymerase. Again, the tool belt that the RNA polymerase carries along with it. Um, and the trimethylation, again, you can just look at genes here and you'll notice that there's lots of these methylations that happen here. At the beginning, this is shutting down transcription, and these here, which are much more positive for later on. So let's look at a more general picture of this as one specific example. I didn't mention the names of the proteins that are involved there because I don't expect you to remember them. Um, here, very often, you've got your promoter, promoter just indicated here with their Tata box, in chromatin, so bound up with a whole bunch of nucleosomes and then a binding site for your enhancer binding protein, somewhere around there. Sometimes this guy's going to be able to bind by itself because of nucleosome breathing, um, but often 
you have to have one of these chromatin remodeling complexes. Remember, these are ATP-dependent complexes that will bind to nucleosome-bound templates and move stuff around. And they can either just move the nucleosomes back and forth in such a way that the promoter is now available to get whatever sticky thing this guy wants to associate here. You'll also notice that our chromatin remodeling complex interacts here with our transcriptional activator. And one of the main things that transcriptional activators can do is help get chromatin remodeling complexes to the right part of DNA so that you can have this remodeling that takes place. In some cases, you take the histones off completely. Some cases, you even exchange the histones with an alternative histone. We talked about alternative histones when we talked about chromatin way back when. It turns out that there are some histones that have alternative histones that are associated with them that turn out to be really good at allowing transcription to take place. They don't compact the chromatin as much. And so you have a lot more transcription that takes place there. Or you can physically modify the histones themselves, like by methylation, which we just looked at um, in the last case. Here's another example of that. Here's a <clears throat> act, as in an activation protein, that could or could not necessarily interact with this particular piece of DNA. Here are nucleosomes. Here are the ATP-dependent chromatin remodeling complexes that will both allow binding or not allow binding. Here, by moving the histones around, this is one particular group of chromatin remodeling complexes. Here is an example of where you have a histone chaperone, which is completely exchanged out the histones, which are here in this nucleosome. And in some cases, you'll completely lose those nucleosomes altogether. So these are just three examples of basically what we're looking at back here with the real names. And if you're interested, you can take a look at this article here in Nature. So <clears throat> that's what happens with chromatin. Once we get rid of those nasty nucleosomes or move them away such a way, um, well, how are these transcriptional regulators working? So we already talked about this particular aspect right here. Here's your transcriptional regulator bound to an enhancer. Maybe it's looping around, but it helps get the whole complex here, you know, your dog bones and so on and so forth, all associated with the promoter. Oops, saw um, And I'm probably running into the cables here. Uh, you can get transcription to take place. In many cases, to get this whole thing to work, it's not just one transcriptional activator. You need a whole bunch. And so sometimes it's just stimulation of binding of other regulators which you need to get and then follow through with some of these later ones. We talked a little bit about open complex formation going from when the DNA is together, the DNA is opening up. What does that require in eukaryotic promoters? Activity of TF2H, the helicase. Um, some of these activators, in fact, will interact with and stimulate the activity of TF2H. And so these will, say, have your release RNA polymerase in order to begin transcription. In the animation that we looked at, again, probably far too long ago, there was the pre-initiation complex sitting at the promoter. And then the DNA looped around with the activator, and it touched that, and all of a sudden the RNA polymerase took off. That would be this example here, C. We also talked about abortive initiation. Remember where it sticks out a couple of nucleotides and then restarts and keeps going again? Some of the transcriptional activators will allow the polymerase to escape from this either abortive initiation. And even in some cases, the polymerase will start and then stop and wait for a little while. And it just sits there until there's some kind of interaction with an activator. So four different ways, and certainly A here can combine with any of the rest of these in order to be stimulating transcription. 
So let's look in a little bit more at some of the things that are going on with chromatin. Here's the example from your textbook. Now zooming in at one particular nucleosome. Here we have our binding site for our transcriptional regulator. And then a coactivator. In this case, coactivator is one of the ones that are best understood. Has an enzymatic activity, histone acetyltransferase. So what do histone acetyltransferases do? They put acetyl groups onto histones, particularly onto lysines. So acetyl group, that gives you your at least neutralization of charge. Under some conditions, it'll also have a negative charge. It's pushing those tails away from the DNA. Very often, that'll also bring in a second coactivator, which is a histone kinase. What do histone kinases do? They'll phosphorylate. They can't phosphorylate <coughs> lysines or arginines. They're phosphorylating mostly serines and threonines. Again, phosphate, large, negative charge. It'd be pushing away the DNA from the nucleosome. Once we have these interactions, in many cases, you'll also bring in your chromatin remodeling complexes, again, interacting with these activators, but also the modified tails that you have on your nucleosome. TF2D binds to not only freed up DNA that you've pulled the nucleosome off of, but also some of the TF2D subunits. And you remember, TF2D is not just the Tata binding protein. It's got all of these other proteins that are associated with it. Those will associate with the modified histone tails as well. So modification of histones seems to be really important in terms of getting your transcriptional initiation complex to go. Once you have TF2D, normally the rest of this will allow you to come together. This process does seem to be pretty sequential. So unlike we had that one example where the whole homoenzyme comes in at once, um, you pretty much do seem to have to have first modification, then chromatin remodeling, and then association of the pre-initiation complex in order to get transcription taking place. I just wanted to mention bromo domains here really quickly. Bromo domains is just a name of a particular domain that interacts with acetylated lysines on histones. And so anything that's going to associate with these acetylated lysines is called the bromo domain. We didn't talk much about it, but chromo domains are sort of the opposite of that. And I like to think of chromo domains that interact with methylated lysines. That helps you for heterochromatin. So chromo domains, heterochromatin, compacted, and then bromo is the flop side where you have things that are now going to be opening up your chromatin, allowing gene expression to take place. So any questions on chromatin, chromatin remodeling? Yeah. Pause. Pause. Yeah. So these are, uh, okay, I, I'm glossing over that. <laughs> so there's both. We have abortive initiation and pauses, which are separate things. But the idea here is that the polymerase has started, but it hasn't completed. It hasn't moved forward yet. And so that can either be sitting at one particular place or it could be going through the abortive initiation process. Either of those can be happening there. So, yeah. Ridiculously complex, these darn eukaryotes. We'd be way better just to stick with bacteria. Uh, so <clears throat> this is, in fact, this um, image again from the textbook is going back to this idea back here at the beginning where you have one of your transcriptional regulators that interact with a second transcriptional regulator. And what's been found through experiments a lot like the one that I talked about with the GAL4 separating the two di activation domains relative to each other, you can do exactly the same thing with reporter genes, and that's basically what's shown here. If you have one DNA binding site and one transcriptional activator, you'll get a small amount of transcription. You have one transcriptional activator, bind to one binding site, you have a small amount. But if you put the two of them together, you end up with way, way, way more. And so, yeah, one plus two equals 100. No, it's just that these two together end up with 100. This is just one particular example here. And so the synergy means that the two together they 
<clears throat> putting the two together is much more than the sum of the individuals. And that is very true for transcriptional regulation, as you've got more activation basically the more that you have in the process. So it's another way of looking at basically what we looked at on the last slide. If you think about activation of transcription, the very first thing that happens is you have a gene activator protein that binds to your chromatin. But that in and of itself is nowhere near enough. We've got to get all the way to transcriptional initiation down here. Usually going to have to remodel that chromatin through, surprise, surprise, a chromatin remodeling complex. But just remodeling the chromatin is not enough. You need histone modification. Usually that will bring more activator proteins, again, giving the synergistic effect. Finally, you'll end up with your general transcription factors. And then, even after you have your pre-initiation complex, then you have transcription initiation. And why, one might ask, are you going to have all of these different levels of processes that you have to go through? And the basic message here is that it allows you to have regulation happening at many different steps. And so you can regulate how your protein is binding here, the activity of your chromatin remodeling complex, the activity of your histone modification enzymes, availability of other activator proteins, how well you have bind to the Tata box. This is also a consensus sequence. So if you've got a really good consensus sequence, you probably don't need as many of these. Whereas if your consensus sequence, uh, the sequence you have is not close to the consensus, you're going to need to have a lot of extra help to bring your polymerase here. And then the rearrangement process down here, that's going to be your escape from pause or allowing the polymerase to move forward. This varies for different genes in the most complicated genes to express, you're going to have to go through the whole process. The least complicated ones, you may even actually have the polymerase sitting there ready to go and just need one little tick to set it off. So this is all activation. We also, of course, have repression. Curiously enough, um, eukaryotic systems seem to use way more activators than repressors, whereas for bacteria it's the flip, way, flip side. So many more repressors in bacteria and less activators. Probably has to do with chromatin in and of itself, interaction with the nucleosomes is pretty repressive already. And so activation is helping get over that. Whereas for bacteria, yes, the DNA is compacted, but nowhere near to the same extent that you have it in eukaryotic systems. But nonetheless, there are some repressors. And repressors can act just like the Bacterial repressors are working in terms of polymerase binding. You've got two overlapping DNA binding sites. If a repressor binds, then the activator can't bind. The activator can't bind. It's not going to stimulate assembly of your pre-initiation complex. In some cases, there are repressors that will bind to that sticky part of the activation domain that you have on your enhancer binding protein. And so block the sticky part. Now it can't interact with any of the other proteins that it needs to do. Um, or in some cases, it will interact with some of the general transcription factors and basically hold them in either such a way that they can't interact with all the rest of the general transcription factors and the polymerase, or literally block some of the interactions that an activator would have with some of those proteins. So these are all going to be direct ways that you have repression, but we also have chromatin. And so a number of transcriptional repressors are going to interact with chromatin through other proteins. And classic examples are going to be chromatin remodeling complexes. Chromatin remodeling complexes are going to move nucleosomes around. If your nucleosome happens to be moved now right on top of your promoter, then you're going to have trouble assembling a pre-agination complex. And so this would be an indirect way that one of your repressors is working. More likely, or so more, I say more frequently, I should say, is these repressors will bind to co-repressors, remember, non-DNA binding proteins, which will then lead to repression taking place. Very often, these are going to be enzymes, which will 
take off the acetyl groups that your histone acetyl transferase put on in the first place. So activation of genes, repression of genes, just by reversing that activity. And histone methyltransferases are also usually leading to repression of transcription as soon as you methylate. So if you bind to a histone methyltransferase, bring that next to the DNA, next to the histones where you don't want to have transcription taking place, that's a way you can have a nice you know, co-repressor. And so when we talk about co-activators and co-repressors, they're either going to be those that interact directly through protein-protein interactions, or they're going to have these activities, which are enzymatic activities, modifying the chromatin. So questions on repressors, activators? Yes, sorry. So yes, so the, the, so the, the question here, I'm um, sorry to uh, repeat here, but uh, chromatin remodeling complexes look like they're working in both places. So you've got chromatin remodeling complexes that are important for activation and chromatin remodeling complexes that are important for repression. And the answer is yes, both. And so a chromatin remodeling complex, remodeling chromatin is just changing it from where it was before. So the chromatin could be in a case where you're getting transcription taking place, and then you remodel it, it will become non-active, or it can be non-active that gets remodeled to become active. And it turns out that it's exactly the same proteins that do this. So it's not one versus another. Um, you can end up having both. And it's really going to depend on exactly where your binding site is going to be for your repressor or for your activator and where the nucleosomes happen to be relative to the promoter and how those then get moved. So it is unfortunately, you're exactly right, it's a rather confusing process, but chromatin remodeling complexes are used in both. They're used both in repression and in activation. Hey, I just wanted to look at one example of this process here where we've got multiple regulators all bound to DNA and giving you, in fact, different functions based on where they are. This is a really nice example of a basic helix leucine zipper. June, which is a transcriptional regulator, um, mutated, in fact, in a whole bunch of different cancers, um, that can heterodimerize with another protein through these coiled-coil interactions. It's a basic helix that binds to the DNA, and through protein-protein interactions, interacts with Another factor, see all these Fs here? Whenever you see Fs in the acronym for a name, it's probably going to be some kind of DNA binding protein. Uh, these guys interact with specific sequences, and it turns out that binding on this side gives you one set of reactions. Binding on the other side gives you a different set of reactions. Just the exact combination of where these individual proteins are associated with DNA gives you a different outcome. And again, this was just supposed to be an example. Don't worry about all the details on here. I just like this particular image where you've got you know, three different DNA binding proteins binding in slightly different ways to slightly different DNA sequences, which are giving you very different kinds of outcomes um, down here at the bottom. So I want to talk about a couple of examples. There are basically examples for every single gene that we could think of in you know, thick humans, so 20,000 different genes, and every one of these genes is going to be regulated in a slightly different way. We don't have time to go through all 20,000 of them. Um, but just a couple of examples here of some of the regulation that has been actually really well understood, and believe it or not, are some of the simpler systems. Uh, the first one we'll probably talk about, we'll probably just end talking about this one now. We'll talk about mating type switching, um, lambda, and some overall circuits next week. Positional expression in Drosophila embryos. So Drosophila is a wonderful genetic system, originally developed, I think, in the 20s and 30s. It'd be the, oh, wow, it's almost like 100 years ago. Amazing. Um, so 1920s, 1930s um, were a really great model system for studying genetics. And the main reason for studying them, and people who are in the genetics class can correct me if uh, Dr. Reddy says something different, uh, they undergo lots and lots of generations really quickly. And you, get, you can get very, very many of them. Any of you have compost here, you know that you get lots and lots of Drosophila. Uh, 
um, regular fruit flies. Um, easy to grow, easy to get lots of, and quite easy to follow the embryos. Um, these are just the eggs which form, and then once they're fertilized, go through lots of different processes. One of the really nice things about Drosophila embryos is they're pretty big. Okay, so it's about, about the size of a grain of rice. And in their development process, they have these large cells, also called syncytia. And basically, this is one cell. The cytoplasm is shared, but multiple different nuclei. And talking development, how this actually happens. But each of these nuclei are separate, and they're all in separate different parts in the Drosophila embryo. And you can tell what the front end is and the back end, anterior and posterior, for this little end piece here. So just looking at individual embryos, you can see very nicely what's the front end, what's the back end, and that means you can actually line all of them up relative to each other. And then you can just look at what genes are being expressed in these individual embryos, and then particularly in the individual nuclei, which are here. And it turns out that looking at a number of different gene regulatory proteins here, and these are just four of them, which will become important a little bit later on, uh, they're present in different parts of the embryo. Bicoid and hunchback are all present here at the anterior end, and they're actually in a gradient. They're highest concentration here, lower concentration here. And we'll talk about how that happens um, a little bit later on. But just for the time being, high concentration here, low concentration here. There's some other proteins that are present in this one giant cell, giant. Um, and the other thing here is just to remember all of the geneticists. They name the genes based on the mutant phenotype. And so if you knock out the giant gene, you end up with giant flies, actually giant embryos. Is there a question in the back? You're just stretching. Um, and then this one, which is one of my favorites, um, a lot of the Drosophila geneticists, the original ones are German. In fact, Tübingen in Germany is one of the main places that a lot of the Drosophila developmental biologists are. Cripple, anyone know what cripple stands for? Cripple is cripple, so it's the same root. Um, so how you know you have a crippled fruit fly? Crippled fruit fly embryo? Not quite sure, but again, this is what they named this particular um, mutant form. It turns out it's a regular DNA regulatory protein, and it's expressed in just one very specific place in the embryo. And all embryos you look at, as long as they're at this particular developmental stage, are going to have a gradient of bicoid, a gradient of hunchback, and then bands of expression of giant and a band of the, the cripple protein. Even more amazing is if you look at some other gene regulatory proteins, and this is the even skipped gene, also known as EVE, there are multiple segments in the Drosophila embryo where even skipped is expressed, and it turns out that there are seven specific places in the Drosophila embryo where these are being expressed. Each of the little dots, which hopefully you can see here, each of those represents one nucleus here, so where they're all being expressed. And so when you look at the green fluorescence here, and it's just an antibody that binds to that particular protein that's going to fluoresce green, um, seven stripes. You also now take your embryos, here's your anterior, here's your posterior over here, stain them with an antibody that interacts with a giant protein, you have these red bands. And so you can see that giant overlaps a little bit here, but most importantly, we're going to concentrate on band two here. Uh, and what you can hopefully see is that giant is expressed right up to here, and then also again over here. So people got interested in studying even skipped, um, partly because it's got this really amazing expression pattern here. And so this is, uh, again, one of these Drosophila embryos, anterior to posterior, seven stripes of expression of this particular protein. Now, remember, all these nuclei have the same genetic information in them, all the way from anterior to posterior. How does this nucleus know to express even skipped? How does this nucleus right next to it know not to express it? How does this one know to express it, this one not express it, et cetera? And so that is basically what 
these researchers were trying to figure out. And what they found was when they sequenced the gene, here's the gene which is actually making that transcriptional regulator, normal Tata box, start a transcription, and then a whole bunch of binding sites for various different regulatory proteins that are next to the gene. And it turns out that there are seven of these regulatory segments right next to the gene. And even more amazing is you can take one of these segments, put it next to a reporter gene, and put this reporter gene into a Drosophila embryo and find if you get this one particular regulatory element, you get expression of your reporter gene only in this one stripe here. So what that basically says is that each of these seven regulatory segments here is responsible for expression of the even skip gene in one of these seven different fragments. So somehow this DNA sequence leads to expression of this gene only in this case, only in this place, excuse me. So how does that work? Turns out it's just about these four proteins. The bicoid protein, the cripple protein, the giant protein, and the hunchback protein. These are two activators. Bicoid and hunchback are activators and two repressors. Cripple and giant are two repressors. These guys can bind to multiple different sites in this regulatory segment, in this, you know, <clears throat> piece of DNA. So if you look at all of the possible different binding sites here in this stripe 2 module or stripe 2 element, regulatory element, you see that Kruppel can bind here, but Bicoid could bind here too, Giant could bind here, Bicoid could bind here, and various different proteins that could be bound to this particular segment of DNA. Well now if you remember, and I can't, so that's why I put this thing down here in the bottom, um, where these different proteins are being expressed, bicoid again is in a gradient starting at the anterior, going down toward the posterior. Hunchback is present at the anterior, gets less and less toward the posterior, and then giant is in two stripes and cripple is in two stripes. And this is just where they're being expressed in the cell. You can zoom into the stripe two, where we know that we get expression based on this particular segment. And what we see is that you're getting expression of even skipped just at this particular position in the embryo, right next to where giant is expressed, right before cripple is expressed, but you still have expression of hunchback and bicoid. Now remember, hunchback and bicoid are positive regulators. Giant and cripple are negative regulators. So in the presence of cripple and giant, just the presence of these two proteins, the two different hats here, you'll be blocking binding by the activators. In the absence of these guys, so you're missing these guys, then you'll have binding of the activators, but the only place in the whole embryo that that happens is right here. Everywhere else in the embryo, you're going to have binding by either these negative regulators, the repressors, or you're not going to have the activators here. Everything at the posterior, not going to be here. Everything anterior, they're there, but in many cases, you're going to have this piece. Yes? Okay, so going back just one, mm -hmm. um, you said something that made me think that these were nonspecific sequences, since you were saying that you get a various different combinations. Are they, quote unquote, relatively nonspecific, so meaning only those four proteins Okay, so may maybe I misspoke here. This is a very specific DNA sequence that we're looking at here. And so basically this sequence, and I'll back up even one more, this sequence leads to expression of your reporter gene right here, just right here. This sequence is also present in all the cells here and in all the cells, just actually all the nuclei, because it's one big cell. 
but all the nuclei on this side of that and all the nuclei over here as well. But it's not being expressed there. It's not being turned on. And so the only time that you're getting expression here is when you don't have, let's actually get the pen back here, when you don't have any of these negative regulators here. So if none of them are there, then you can get binding by all of the positive regulators and get expression there. As soon as you move outside of that, then you'll have these negative regulators that'll bind to those specific sequences. And if they bind there, now you can't get binding of all of these activators. Yeah? This would be a really good example of competitive binding. So one binding versus the other. So that, that first example of direct repression from about six slides ago, where you've got you know, binding by the repressor, you can't get the activator to bind there. So this is how we get positional expression um, for Drosophila embryos. Uh, just two more quick things before we finish. Um, nowhere near as much detail here, but the basic point here is that you can have transcriptional regulatory proteins binding to different parts of DNA. And remember we talked about enhancers being able to be upstream and downstream of your transcriptional start site. These proteins, again, are going to activate. They're going to activate and repress under certain conditions. If you think about beta globin, where do you need beta globin? Globin, like hemoglobin. You just need these in blood cells. You don't need them anywhere else. And so you're going to want to have expression of these particular genes only in the blood cells. But when you're in these blood cells, you want to be expressing a whole ton of it. And so these are some of the proteins that are involved in that process. Again, the numbers here are not actually critical. But again, you've got interactions between different proteins that in most cells are not going to be activating and in some cells will. And so it turns out that the CP1 protein here is really important for um, activation here. But GATA1, it's... You know, CP1 is a nonspecific in terms of non-cell specific. GATA1 is extremely specific. You need to have the appropriate combination of these different genes. And no, I'm not going to ask you the names for all of these. Um, but different combinations of these genes in order to get them to work. So how do you get transcription factors to function? Say, usually activators or, for that matter, repressors. You either make them, protein synthesis, or you regulate them in some way. Lots of different kinds of regulation. We already talked about binding of a ligand for tryptophan repressor, for LAC repressor, for CAP activation. Same thing is true for a lot of eukaryotic regulators. We'll talk about one next time. You can modify your transcriptional regulator Phosphorylation is a classic way of doing it, but that's not by no means the only one. That will change, again, your structure, allow you to have activation. Many cases, and we'll talk about some of these, I think, a little bit later on. Um, you actually have protein-protein interactions that will cause activation. You can also think of this kind of like a co-activator. We've got a DNA binding piece that has to come together. In many cases, you have a transcriptional activator that's blocked in some way. And we talked about this case, I think, after class and office hours last time. Uh, but here, you have an inhibitor which is literally blocking the sticky part, your transcriptional activation or transcriptional regulation part. That can get removed. In many cases, it's through covalent modification. You can remove an inhibitory protein which will allow that activator to get into the nucleus. That can happen this way or this way. Again, we'll talk about some examples of that. And in a few cases, there's even proteolysis that will lead to activation of transcription. These are all general things. We'll talk about some of the specific ones next time after the weekend.